The Christmas story, uh, as I just said, Christmas story is the most amazing story. Um, miraculous story, momentous story of all time. Um, and specifically, and you might say, uh, what about the cross or what about the resurrection? You can make arguments that like the, the resurrection is, you know, the biggest moment. You know, like what's the biggest moment in church, Christmas or Easter? And it's like, you could, you could make those arguments, but here's the reality. Obviously, you don't get the cross without the birth of Jesus. You don't get the resurrection without the cross, and you don't get the cross without the birth. The birth of Jesus Christ is the single uh, greatest story of all time. But more specifically today, and this is what I want to teach you for the next few minutes, more specifically than the Christmas story is the virgin birth itself. Not, here's my statement of the day. Not only Jesus being born, but specifically Jesus being born to a virgin is the single most necessary fact in the entire gospel story and therefore to our lives. Without Jesus being born to a virgin, the Old Testament and its prophets are null and void. Without Jesus being born to a virgin, the New Testament is impossible. Without Jesus being born to a virgin, there's no forgiveness of sin because Jesus wouldn't have been a worthy sacrifice. Therefore, none of us would have eternal life and none of us would have a relationship with God. Therefore, Jesus being specifically born to a virgin um, is the single most necessary fact to our lives. Without it, there's no reconciliation of God and man. And this virgin birth that we see at Christmas was prophesied all the way from the beginning of the Bible. And so here's what we're going to do today. I don't have three or five points. I have a, a short journey that I want to take us on starting in Genesis. You don't hear Genesis read very much in a Christmas message. But as we talk about the virgin birth, we can't understand how big of a deal this is, how necessary and vital it is to the story, unless we go all the way back to when sin entered the world. So let's go back. Let me take you back on a journey. In Genesis, we get the account of Adam and Eve being created, everything being perfect, God putting them in charge of the garden. They had dominion. They worked. Everything was great. Um, and then he had given them one thing that they were not allowed to do. And of course, like all of us, like every human being, they did the one thing he said not to do. Sin enters the world. God shows up still as he always does and as he always has. There are some people I heard, this is what I hear, I hear this all the time, but I heard this Christmas like, uh, I'm not, the church would burn down if I walked in. I'm not, you know, I'm not really a church person. If I came this Christmas Eve, you know, I don't know if I belong. I don't know if I fit. You know, God always shows up even after you sin, which means no matter how bad you are, no matter how far you are from God, he's chasing you down, and you need to know this. The proof that he is is that you're sitting here. You say, nobody loves me. God loves you. We love you. The proof of that is you're here. We might not even know you, but we love you already. That's, that's what we say at our church, love church. We love you already. You say, well, I'm doing bad things. Yeah, well, we want to help each other not do bad things. That's what church is about, help each other live everything God's called us to be. We already love you. God chases you down. Adam and Eve sinned. They rebelled against him. God still showed up. But when he shows up, he's dealing out consequences because how many know there's still consequences for sin? There was less amens on that part, but you know it's true, so you don't really have a choice. And you already committed to amening a minute ago, and so you said amen again. But God's dealing the consequences of sin, and he's talking at this point where we're going to pick up the story uh, to the serpent. So he's talking to the devil. And in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, it says this. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, tempted Eve and caused Adam and Eve to fall into sin, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. But I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and hers. Now, let me pause here. Can you all go deep on Christmas Eve morning still? Can you follow me? Listen to this. This is what you need to understand about this passage. God talking to the devil right here is the first prophecy of what's going to happen at Christmas. This is a prophetic moment. Because when God says, I'm going to put enmity between your offspring and her offspring, he's not talking about the devil's offspring and Eve's offspring. Because you need to know this, once Adam and Eve had sinned, Adam and Eve's offspring were the devil's offspring. They were all born in this, under the curse of sin. We are all born under the curse of sin because of Adam and Eve's sin. 
This, right here in this moment, scholars will tell you that when he says your offspring and hers, when he says hers, he's referring to the second Eve or Mary, the one who would align with the will of God instead of step outside of the will of God. He says there's going to be hostility between the offspring of sin and the offspring of Mary, which would start with who? Jesus. God's saying there's going to be hostility between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. It goes on to say this. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Other translations say bruise his heel. This is a beautiful verse because this verse is already God showing us that although there was going to be thousands of years of of, of suffering, thousands of years of trying to get to God and we can't, that ultimately he, who is he, Jesus would crush the head of Satan and sin and death would be defeated once and for all. Even from the beginning of time, even before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain. God's plan of victory was already in place. And here's God prophesying it. And he says, he, he's, he, you're going to bruise his heel. But how many know when your heel gets bruised, you recover? But how many know when the head of a snake gets crushed, it doesn't recover? God says, oh, devil, you'll get your blow. He'll be in the grave for three days. But three days later, he will rise never to die again. And sin and death will be defeated once and for all. Come on, how many are thankful for the gospel? This is a a look forward. This is a prophetic look at what's going to happen. There's going to be an offspring of Satan, all who are born in sin. There's going to be an offspring of Mary, a child that was born of God, and then all that would come after when they make the decision to follow him and they're born again. And so we have to go all the way back to Genesis to understand this is the setup. This is why the the virgin birth matters. This is going to help you understand is because we, born to all of our mamas, everybody in here, I don't know much about you, but you you were born to a mama, all of you. Everybody here, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, what your beliefs are, you're born to a woman. You can't get around it. And so we all have that in common. When you were born to that woman, you were born spiritually into sin. And there's going to be hostility between those born into sin and the kingdom of light. Even in this prophecy in Genesis 3, there's talk of offspring of generations. And so let's move on. Isaiah 7. The prophet Isaiah is um, speaking hundreds of years now before Christ's birth, um, but this is a long time after Genesis 3, and he's prophesying into uh, the darkness that Israel was facing. And this is a time where there is not hope. This is a time where there's much despair. And that's where we get this prophecy from Isaiah that says this, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This prophecy is 700 years before Jesus. Isaiah is looking forward to this Messiah. And even in the name that he says he will have, we see what is going to happen at Christmas is that it's going to be God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. A virgin is going to conceive and give birth to God. This is what Isaiah is beginning to say. And so the prophets are talking about it. The prophets are looking forward, and it's throughout the Old Testament. And then we arrive at the Gospels. That's kind of like the setup. But then we arrive at the Gospels, and today we'll read uh, from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. This is really like our anchor reading of the day. But with all of that backdrop, with all of that context, I want us to read verses 26 through 38, and it says this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what type of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? 
Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin, which is a very valid question where she's going, she, in, in, the, in the tone of her question, the attitude of her question is not a rebellious attitude. The, the, the attitude of her question is curiosity. I'm a virgin. How is this going to happen? And I want you to catch verse 35 today, church. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This verse changes everything. This word for overshadowed is the same word. It's used very rarely three times in the New Testament. One is when Peter and John are walking along the street, and the power of God is flowing so powerfully through them that people who are sick are trying to get into their shadows, and if they would just get into their shadow, they were being healed because they were overshadowed with the presence of God. The only other time it's used is when on, at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus' face is overshadowed with light, the light of God, and, and then here. This is a powerful moment when the Holy Spirit of God comes and overshadows a virgin girl and impregnates her with the Son of God. Y'all say, this sounds crazy. Well, this is a Christmas story. This is a story that you celebrate, the story that we believe. <laughs> but I think sometimes we miss the power of it. We miss the depth of it. We, we ignore the enormity of the miracle that Mary had no relations with Joseph, yet she becomes pregnant with God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. By the way, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God overshadows each and every person here today, overshadows your pain, overshadows your hurt, overshadows the disappointment, overshadows sickness, so that we can have a divine encounter with God. That's my prayer for today. This is what happens to Mary, that she is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And he says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. Other translations say, for nothing shall be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. I want to go back to verse 35 and just sit here for a moment. This is an incredible thought. Jesus' conception. You, you, you guys have to understand this. Jesus didn't come down from heaven the way he's going to come down this next time. He didn't come in on chariots. He didn't descend from God. He was put into the womb of a woman. Listen to me, the same way you were. Like without getting graphic, there, there is seed and there is egg. Y'all know how that works? Do you know that Jesus did not bypass the system to come here? He came through the same creation system that he made. Seed and egg. He wasn't born of divine egg. <laughs> he was born of Mary's egg but he was born of a supernatural seed from God. Watch this. Fully God, son of God. Yet fully man, son of man. The DNA of God, yet the DNA of man. The divinity of God, the humanity of man. Are you following? Born of a woman was literally a fetus. You think about that. He was literally a fetus. Mary's water broke. Your mother's water broke or was broken. You know that. I'm trying to get you to, to feel this today, to feel the power of this story and of this miracle today that water broke. You were born of water. All of us were born of water. There was water breaking. Do you know that Mary's water broke? Because Jesus was also born of water. Fully man. A natural birth, like every one of us, he's just like us. Yet he's born of the Father God, not the seed of Adam. 
And the spiritual principle is that sin is passed down through the seed. Catch this today. Sin is passed down through the seed. And and Jesus was not born of the seed of Joseph, which would have been the seed ultimately of Adam. Jesus was born of the seed of God. No brokenness in the DNA. No sin in the DNA. Therefore, he's nothing like us. Oh, he's just like us. Oh, but he's nothing like us. He's the son of God, yet he's the son of man. If he was only man, he could understand us, but he could not save us. If he was only God, he could save us, but he could not understand us. But the miracle of the virgin birth is that he was fully God and fully man, and he understands you, but he's here to save you today. Are you tracking with what's happening? There was a break in the bloodline. And the reason that the miracle of the virgin birth was necessary is because he had to be a man. That's why he was born of Mary. But he had to be perfect. That's why he was born of God. And you might be thinking, okay, what's the so what of this? What does this matter to me? This is what I want you to catch today. You might be thinking, that's awesome. That's a deep thought. It's just, I never thought about it that way or I've learned something today that's powerful. But what does it have to do with me? Let me take you to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. I need you to hear this today. If you think that you're not good enough, if you think that you never can change, if you think that, you're, that God's mad at you, if you think that you don't belong in a place like this, hear 1 Peter 1, 23. Listen to me. You have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Do you know what incorruptible seed means? It means the seed that was put in Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, Savior, you have another birth, and it's not of water. It's a birth of the Spirit. Jesus said it's being born again. And when you're born again, you're born to the Father God with the seed now being the incorruptible seed of heaven. You have a different bloodline. You have a different spiritual DNA. You have a new nature. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. But the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual didn't come first, but the natural. But after, the spiritual. The first man was the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Are you seeing this? As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. When you put your faith in Jesus, you become of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Once you surrender yourself to Jesus, you, become, you put your faith in him, you, you enter a new lineage, you have a new nature, you have a new image, you have the image of God inside of you that now you can grow into. Come on, how many are thankful for the grace of God that births us all over again, gives us a brand new life and a brand new start? That's the power of the virgin birth. Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 5, 18 and 19, he says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Thank you, Jesus. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11, since we have been unified with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives, but we are no longer slaves to sin. You gotta know today, the head of Satan was crushed at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, and now that sin DNA no longer has a hold on you. Do you still have to deal with sin? Do you have to still deal with temptation on this side of eternity? Yes, we do, but overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loves us. That's the gospel. Verse 7 says, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. And we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. I got to pause right there. I know we're not at Easter yet. But I got to talk about this for a second. Because you say, how do we know about the virgin birth? How do we know that's true? Let Let me talk to a skeptic or two or three that are in the room. 
and you're here because your, your, your mom made you come. And, and you, how do I know that that's true? I'll tell you how you know. Luke tells us, I mean, I mean, Paul tells us, the reason that we know that the virgin birth is real is because everything that Jesus said, everything the prophets pointed to, everything that God had ordained in history was validated when he walked out of a tomb. And you say, well, how do we know that he walked out of the tomb? Because the, the message still exists today. Are you kidding me? That the, the, the first eyewitnesses, that if the, the, the most dangerous thing that they could do in their lives would be to spread the rumor that Jesus rose from the dead. In, in that time in the Roman Empire, you start saying that Jesus is not in the grave, you're going to be crucified. And, and believe me, the, the apostles were. They were crucified for this message that they preached, which was that that man walked out of the grave and he ascended to the Father, never to die again. And the only reason the message is still alive today is because it really happened. Nobody could stomp it out. Rome couldn't stop it. No ruler could stop it. No, no, no atheist can stop it. No unbeliever can stop it. The, the fact of the matter is he rose from the dead. And that, that is so true that the message still lives on today. Therefore, everything else that God said is true. The reason he rose from the dead is because he was born of a virgin because he was the son of God. And so we have to pause there and, and, see, and, 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 and sit with what Paul said. We are sure of this. Because why? Because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. And even when you breathe your last breath on this earth, how many know you'll never die again? When a loved one that follows Jesus breathes their last breath on earth, they will never die again. That's the hope of heaven. And so that brings us assurance today, a blessed assurance. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. And may our lives be lived for the glory of God. There's a lot of people out there right now running around living lives for the glory of them. A lot of people living lives for the glory of, of self, for the glory of my retirement account, for the glory of my bank account, for, the glo for, for what makes me happy, what makes me comfortable, what brings me joy, what brings me fulfillment. Love Church, may we always live lives for the glory of God. We're here today to bring glory to God. I hope you enjoy the hot chocolate and the Cinnabon, but we're here today to bring glory to God. He says, may our lives bring glory to God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to sin, and alive to God through Christ Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the one that was born in Bethlehem and became just like us so that we don't worship a far off God who can't understand our pain, who can't understand temptation, who can't understand loss, and he even understands death because he experienced it in his body. So all the way to the bedside, as you've said goodbye to a parent, all the way to that moment where you've experienced tragic loss, he's with you all the way there. And then he's with you on the other side. And so are they who believe. Which gives us the weight of our message that we have to tell as many people about this message so that they can be on the other side too. Some of you in your old nature, you have to deal with generational patterns. This is just how I want to close. I want to just help you. I want to pastor you, if you will. You're here today, and, and, and there are men who, what your father and grandfather, you know, your family has passed down to you is, and you can fill in the blank. It could be addiction, it can be divorce, it could just be patterns. Anger is your temper. Well, you know, in our family, we have a, heart, we have a, a temper that's out of control. In our family, we, in our family, we're, you know, in our this is how it always, this is what I've always done. This is how I've failed. What you're describing, what you're, what you're feeling, what, is that you have inherited something. That's what, that's what you're feeling. I've inherited something that I can't, like, break free from. It's destined to be this way. Here's the ultimate why of the virgin birth mattering to you. It was destined to be that way until Jesus. Remember what Pastor Jonathan said a few weeks ago talking to parents? For those in Christ, it ran, into the, it ran in the family till it ran into me. 
Who cares if it ran in your family? You've been born again. You've been born again. You're not the offspring of Satan. You're the offspring of Jesus. And, and so today, everything can change. Not by you getting yourself together and cleaning yourself up and turning over a new leaf. You're going to fail every time you try to do those things. Everything can change the moment that you surrender to Jesus. Temptations that seem impossible to overcome, trauma from childhood, disappointment from childhood, betrayal, broken relationships, people backstabbing you, things that have set a new course for your life that you don't like, you need to know today, Jesus changes everything. You've been born again of incorruptible seed. Jesus changes your nature. You can start a new legacy. You can have a new identity. You think of Rahab the prostitute. In Joshua 2, she was Rahab the prostitute. In Matthew 1, when we're talking about the lineage of Jesus, she's Rahab the great-grandmother of the Messiah. So, so it's the same woman, same past, but in one, in one passage, Jesus is here. And so whatever the label is in your life, your label can change. Whatever your pattern has been, the pattern can change. Once Jesus arrives, he rewrites stories. The lineage of Adam ran into the lineage of Jesus. And now we are left with a choice. Do we surrender to the lineage of Jesus by putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? If so, everything changes. May our answer this morning be the answer of Mary, which is how this Christmas passage ends. Be it unto me according to thy word. Eve listened to the devil and said, the devil's saying, God doesn't want you to be like him. God's trying to hold out on you. God shouldn't, you know, he shouldn't be doing this. He shouldn't be doing that. And by the way, that's the, that's the lie of culture. It's still around today. It's in all of, it's in all of, the, all of the thought today in culture is we are our own God. And anything, anyone, any authority, any power, any structure that tries to hold you down, get it out of the way, and you rise up. And that was the lie of the enemy. Eve, God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be like him. Come on, just be you. Come on, just be you. Come on, just eat the fruit. Come on, do it. And Eve said, be it unto me, Satan. Over here, you've got Mary. The angel says, you're going to lose your reputation he didn't say that, but he's saying you're, you're a virgin, but you're going to be pregnant, and, and, and people are going to obviously think that you're pregnant because you slept with Joseph, obviously. And you're going to have to walk this road of humility. You're going to have to not worry about what people think, but you're going to you're gonna have to do this. You're going to carry the Son of God. There's a destiny, but there's a price. And Mary's answer is, be it unto me according to thy word. And so on this Christmas Eve, we have a choice. Do we listen to the lies of the enemy? You're done. You're not good enough. You know, it's, it's everybody else's fault. You're just a victim of this. It's never going to change. Are you going to say, all right, be it unto me? Or are you going to listen to God and say, no, no, no. Today, everything can change. But you're going to you're gonna have to crush your pride, surrender, surrender yourself, and trust in this Lord Jesus that we are talking about and celebrating this Christmas. If you'll surrender to him, you have victory. But you're going to have to walk a road of humility. You're going to have to walk a road of trust. And you're going to have to walk a road of surrender. That's the call. Pick up your cross and follow him. And if you follow him into death of pride and self, then you get to follow him into eternal life. That's the road that I want. That's the road that I want all of you to choose is to say, be it unto me, God. So here's, here's two things, and I'm going to pray. Two, two groups of people. I don't want to overly generalize this, but this is pretty safe to say there are people here in this room that you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. I would say that you're not a Christian, but some people say I'm Christian because they've categorized themselves as Christian if they have to pick something. But saying you're Christian doesn't make you Christian. Christian, Christ follower, is somebody who has said, I, sur I trust him with my life. I'm not perfect, of course. We're not talking about being perfect or having everything together. We're talking about who do you trust in. That's what makes you a Christian. And so there are people here who you haven't surrendered your life to God and you need to. So for you, the be it unto me, God, according to your word, is I want to align with, be it unto me, the gospel. Like, like 
you dying for my sins. May that be unto me according to your word. That's where you need to start today. That's the best decision you could ever make with your life. We're going to pray in a moment. There's another group of people here, and, and it would be many of you, I know, that you have surrendered to Jesus, but how, but how many would just raise a hand to make other people feel a little bit better about themselves, that you ain't have it all together? All right, so that's like, that's all of us. So if you're here today and you're like, I'm a Christian, but I'm struggling, welcome. And, and here's how we can take this message today. May your promises to me be fulfilled. So I wrote some things down that you will believe that your actions and your attitudes can change because of a different lineage. There are, there are some young people today that your biological family pattern will not be what defines your life. You're going to change generations because you surrendered to Jesus. And it all starts in a moment like this. Your children and your grandchildren can grow up to be men and women of God because one Christmas Eve you said, I surrender my life to Jesus. I'm going to stop trying to do this my way. And, and, and I'm going to break the power, this addiction that's over me, I'm going to let God break it by surrendering to him, by getting involved in his church and talking, help, letting people help me through this. Uh, the things that you face, Christian, you can change them with the power of God, be it unto me. For those of you that are believing for miracles, there are people here that are believing for miracles. Miracles in health, miracles in job, miracles in finance, miracles in relationships, miracles for reconciliation. We were preaching about it a couple of weeks ago. Miracles in a relationship that is broken. You're believing for a miracle. So your, your response to this is if Jesus was born to a virgin and if now he's given me a new life and a new power, then may it be unto me according to thy word. And I'm gonna believe that if he's the one who did miracles at Christmas, he's the one who still does miracles today. He's never stopped. If you're believing for a prayer to be answered, if you're believing for a word of God to come to pass, you've received a word from God. You've read a word from God in, in the scripture that not yet is true in your life. Then today it's you saying, be it unto me. I will stand firm and continue to believe, Jesus, that your word is true. For no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. So, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. If you're, if you're a Christian here today, that, those are the things that you can believe. May your promises to me be fulfilled.